Hello everyone. In the previous lecture of nuclear reactions, we discussed the energetics of nuclear reactions. We discussed the Q value, the, the threshold for a nuclear reaction, whether it is for a charged particle induced reaction or neutron induced reaction. So all the energetics, the feasibility of the reaction was studied in that part. In this lecture, I'll be talking about the cross section for the nuclear reaction, how to determine the probability of a nuclear reaction and what are the different types of reactions that take place when you use neutron and charged particle as projectiles. So let us talk about the cross section. A cross section which we denote as sigma is a measure of the probability of occurrence of a nuclear reaction. So that is the Point to note that how what is the probability of occurrence of a nuclear reaction which we represent by sigma. Or to talk in very, very simple terms, you know, it is the cross sectional area that the target nucleus will offer to the projectile. It is a very simplistic way of telling the cross section. In fact, from that only the cross section derives its units of bond, where one bond is 10 power minus 24 centimeter square. So the nuclear dimensions are of the order of Fermi's 10 power minus 13 centimeter. And so in the, in fact the R0, the radius constant is 10 power 1.4, 10 power minus 13 centimeter. And the radii of nuclei will be R0 a raised to one third. So that will be about 10 to the minus 12 or so on. So accordingly, that nuclear area, the cross section of a nucleus, if you just cut the cross section, the circle pi r square will be of the order of 10 to the minus 24 centimeter square and the unit of cross section that's why it's called as a bond when bond is 10 power minus 24 centimeter so it's a very simple way of telling the cross section there are many more things which will come in actually defining the cross section of a nuclear reaction as we go along so how do we use the nuclear reaction cross section in the nuclear reactions when we want to write the rate of a reaction so depending upon whether we are doing neutron induced reaction or charged particle induced reactions, the terms that come into the formulation of nuclear reaction rate will be slightly different, which will I try to highlight here. So the rate of a reaction for neutron induced reaction is called N sigma phi, where N is the number of target atoms per centimeter cube, in fact, actually it is not that way, it is total number of target atoms. N is the total number of target atoms because in case of reactor neutron, suppose you have a reactor neutron, entire target is exposed. So all the atoms in the target are exposed to neutrons. And so N sigma phi, in N, N is the number of target atoms, sigma is the cross section. So you need to use sigma square, the to square and phi is the flux. So how many neutrons are going through a unit area per second that will define the phi. So N into sigma into phi flux is the rate of a reaction that is at the rate at which so if you see here the units will match atoms into centimeter square into neutrons per centimeter square per second. So it will be centimeter square, centimeter square, it will be atoms per second. So this many atoms are formed per second. That is the rate at which the reaction takes place. In the case of charged particle induced reaction, the charged particle induced reaction will be having sort of a, you know, if you have a target, you don't have a C of charged particle, but it will have a B, it will bombard the target. So the, in the target, only a small area is exposed to the B. And therefore, the number of target atoms is not defined total number of atoms but it is the target atoms per centimeter square the unit area how many atoms are present in the target sigma is the cross section and now b the target that the, the whatever is falling on the b and the target is now not per centimeter square per second but it is the number of particles falling on the target per second so there is a slight change in the units of 
flux or the particle intensity. In the case of neutrons, it was flux, neutrons per centimeter square per second. In the case of part charged particles, it is the particles per second. So both the units, both the reaction rates ultimately will come out to be atoms per second. You can see here n sigma i will be number of atoms per centimeter square into centimeter square into particle per second. It will be again atoms per second. So in both the cases, whatever way the units of target atoms and the, the flux or the intensity, we always end up with the n sigma phi or n sigma i s rate of the reaction. Now, as I mentioned that the cross-sectional area offered by the nucleus, target nucleus of the projectile is a very simplistic way of defining the cross-section. Essentially, if you see when the projectile hits the target, depending upon the distance from the center of the target nucleus, there will be different, you know, the, the, the different angular momenta are involved. So, in, in, in actually when you define the nuclear reactions, we have particle is carrying certain amount of angular momentum and that angular momentum will be defined in terms of the r into p where r is the distance radial distance from the target center let us say this is the target center and this is the projectile going so this is like the r so b is nothing but r sin theta so b is called the impact parameter and p is the momentum of the particle so, R cross P is the angular momentum. R into linear momentum is called the angular momentum. And angular momentum is a quantity in nuclear reactions, which you know dictates the different types of mechanisms of the nuclear reactions. So, P, the distance, the vertical distance from the target center to the, the wave at which the projectile is coming, we will call it the impact parameter. And this impact parameter essentially is the R into sine theta. So, this is like, you know, if, you, if it is here, then this is the R and this is theta. So, this is the R sin theta is the impact, the vertical distance from target center to the, the distance of the projectile from the center. Now, the angular, the linear momentum can be written in terms of the de Broglie wavelength, h cross by lambda cross, where lambda cross is the reduced wavelength of the projectile and the angular momentum can be written L h cross. So, essentially, Angular momentum in terms of linear momentum can be now written as LH cross equal to BH cross by lambda cross and so the impact parameter B equal to L into lambda cross. So this impact parameter B essentially is a classical quantity at what distance from the target center the projectile will hit the, will the target center where it will hit the target that will be the impact parameter. And L is the how much of the angular momentum the projectile will bring in in the units of lambda curves. So essentially, the classically you can see the B can take any value, and so the angular momentum can take a continuous values. But then you know that the angular momentum is quantized in quantum systems, and so quantum mechanically, certain values of B will correspond to one value of L. So, L can vary from 0, 1, 2 and so on, H cross. So, you try to have a correlation between the continuously varying impact parameter and the discrete values of L, which I have tried to explain using this. So, this is suppose this is the target nucleus here, cross section of the target and if that projectile hits at the center within this radius, that is the radius of 1 lambda cross that we will call L value equal to 0. So we call it a S wave particle. If it is within the next one L lambda cross, L equal to 1, L equal to 2, L equal to 3 and so on. So depending upon at what distance the projectile is hitting the target nucleus from the center, we can bring in different amount of angular momentum. And the one which is at the maximum of the target radius will be the L max. So let us now try to calculate the cross section for a particular L value. So it is like the annular area of this annulus. So from L equal to 0 to L equal to 1, we will say L equal to L, L equal to so 1 lambda, 0 lambda to 1 lambda to 2 lambda, that is L equal to 1. So this is what I try to calculate here, the angular momentum dependent cross section sigma L. So for a particular concentric ring, 
the sigma l will be area of the outer circle upon area of the minus one upon area of the inner circle. So pi l lambda l plus one lambda cross square minus pi l lambda cross, where l lambda is the impact parameter. So you can see here you can take the pi lambda cross out, and so you are left with l square plus one plus two l that is l plus one square minus l square. So it will be pi lambda cross square two l. So now you can see the cross section for a particular L wave depends upon L value pi lambda cross square 2L plus 1. And since these charged particles are now they can penetrate the Coulombic barrier, so there is a transmission coefficient. Even for the neutron, there is a change in potential and hence there is a transmission coefficient factor that is called that is defined in terms of the transmission coefficient. TL is called the transmission coefficient. for L, particular L value. So now this is the actual definition of the cross section lambda sigma L equal to pi lambda cross square 2L plus 1 TL. So let us now try to see for the total reaction cross section will be the sum of the angular momentum dependent cross section for all L values up to L max. So L max will be R by lambda cross. So we can sum the so, so the reaction cross section sigma r will be pi lambda cross square sum over all the 2l plus 1 values. 2l plus 1 is for 1 l value, so sum over sigma of 2l plus 1. Let us forget about the tl value for the, for the moment. And so we can write it as summation over 2l and summation over n 0 to l max will be l max plus 1. So when you say 0 to l max, so when we sum 1, that many times will become L max plus 1. When you sum L over this one, you will get 2 into summation of L. So now you can write this as pi lambda cross square. Summation of L will be n n n plus 1 by 2. So it will be 2, 2 is outside, L max into L max plus 1 by 2 plus L max plus 1. And so now you can, you can see L max is square plus 2L max plus 1. This whole thing will be L max plus L max square plus 2L max plus 1, that is L max plus 1, whole thing square. And the L max you can write as R by lambda cross because L max equal to R upon lambda cross. So it will become R pi lambda cross square L by lambda cross plus 1. And so you can see here that it will become r by r plus lambda cross upon lambda cross, lambda cross will cancel with this one. You will have pi r plus lambda cross square. So sigma r essentially is pi r plus lambda cross square by summing over the sigma l values from 0 to l max. Now let us discuss these cross sections for neutrons and charged particles separately because the cross section varies in a different fashion for neutral particles like neutrons and the charged particles. So just now we saw sigma was in nothing but pi r plus lambda cross square. So for the case of neutrons, sigma n can be as well written as pi r plus lambda cross square, r plus lambda cross square. So here the rate of the reaction then will be in terms of n sigma phi, where n is the number of target atoms for neutrons, and phi is the flux in terms of neutrons per centimeter square. Now let us go a little bit deep into the how the neutrons are captured by the nucleus. See, for a neutron induced reaction, which are always exoergic. Exoergic means whenever a neutron is captured by a nucleus, energy is released equivalent to the binding energy of neutron in that nucleus. So neutron plus target nucleus has higher mass compared to the neutron, the, the compound nucleus that will be formed. So suppose you write this in the energy term, so this is the mass of the neutron, neutron plus target and this is the mass of the nucleus that is formed. For example, if you say neutron plus 59 cobalt, then this is 60 cobalt, it needs a ground state. So when the neutron is captured by cobalt 60, this much energy is 
the binding energy that is released and so this cobalt 60 will be excited with this much energy of the rod 7 to 8 MeV and this excited nucleus then can emit by gamma ray or it can have other channel source. So neutron induced reactions, particularly the neutron capture reactions, when the neutron is captured by a nucleus, they are always exergic and the energy released is equivalent to the binding energy of neutron in that nucleus. The cross section for such reactions, neutron induced reactions, you can see here sigma n is decreasing with the increasing energy of neutron, in fact, which is called the 1 by V, where V is the velocity of neutron. So neutron induced reaction cross sections, the low energy neutrons are having highest cross section. I'll I'll be explaining this very soon. And at certain intermediate energy, there are resonances. These resonances correspond to the, nu nu the nucleus populated in certain discrete energy state. So this is like a resonance. When the neutron energy is such that the nucleus compound nucleus populates in certain energy level, then you would get a jump in the cross section. When it is somewhere here where there is no level, cross section will not be that much high. Okay, so now the the why this cross section is falling with the increasing energy of neutron at low energy the neutron wavelengths, wavelength of the neutron is lambda cross is much larger than the nuclear radius. You, you know that neutrons are used for neutron diffraction studies where the neutron diffraction means the crystals dimensions of the order of angstrom. So a low energy neutron, thermal neutron will have the wavelength of the order of dimensions of the atoms. So this is much larger than nuclear dimensions and therefore you will find that the as the energy of the neutron is increasing, wavelength is decreasing and so the cross section is also decreasing to put it in a very simple way. So for low energy neutrons in fact the, the, the now you can see here if this is the target nucleus then L equal to 0 because first wavelength itself is more than the dimension of the nucleus and so you will have mostly 0 uh, wave, S wave neutrons so cross section can be written as pi lambda cross square T0, L equal to 0. And as the energy of neutron increases, lambda cross, the reduced wavelength decreases, therefore the cross section is decreasing the energy of neutron. So what are the different types of uh, reactions that can occur with the neutrons? Most important reaction that takes place is called the neutron capture or it is called the Radiative capture. Radiative capture means when the neutron is captured, neutron is captured by a nucleus, the, the nucleus that is formed, compound nucleus, will emit gamma rays. So that is the radiation, gamma radiation. And so neutron uh, capture followed by emission of gamma rays is called radiative capture. And this kind of reactions are most common with thermal neutrons. And as you will always see that when you add a neutron to a stable nucleus, we are increasing the neutron to proton ratio and therefore most of the products of n gamma reactions are beta minus x because we are producing a neutron rich isotope. For example, 197 gold n gamma, 198 gold and this 198 gold will be beta minus active to make a to decay to 198 mercury. So with the heavier nuclei, like cobalt, gold, you know, uranium, tin, lead, the N gamma is the most used common reaction. But when it comes to low Z target nuclei, sulfur, silicon, magnesium, then you will find the reactions where charged particles are emitted, NP reaction, neutron capture followed by proton emission, neutron capture followed by alpha emission. So this kind of reactions are possible with the low Z target nuclei because the Coulomb barrier for emission of protons and alpha are not very high. Whereas for heavy nuclei, the Coulomb barrier for emission of alpha and protons are quite high and so such heavy nuclei do not undergo N gamma type of reaction, but the light nuclei can undergo N gamma type, uh, this N alpha and NP type of reactions. When you go to still heavier elements like actinides, then the thermal neutrons can induce even fission because the fission barriers are low for actinides and so upon capture of a neutron like 235 uranium, even thermal neutrons can induce fission in the heavy nuclear. Now the when you see depending upon the energy, the type of reactions that take place with neutrons, neutrons are classified into uh, 
normal neutrons having energy less than 0.5 electron volt epithermal neutrons epithermal means the a region where no the it is slightly higher than thermal and there are resonances in the cross sections as a function of energy of neutron 0.5 electron volt to about the kv of energy and then more than 1 kv are called the fast neutrons so you can see here that common neutrons are most reactive and this classification actually has come from cadmium the cadmium is absorbing all the thermal neutrons so if you wrap a sample with a cadmium foil all thermal neutrons are captured and that the sample will not see the thermal neutron so that from that this classification has come that uh, if it is less than 0.5 ev then energy that is called in the thermal neutron so we classify it into two three zones low energy zone where it is 1 by v law the resonance region and the fast neutron energy region thus to explain why cross section for the neutron neutron reaction follows 1 by v if you recall we said 1 by v law and then the resonances so we try to explain using the transmission of neutron through the potential well the cross section for the neutron total cross section is pi r plus lambda cross square and for low energy neutrons we said that lambda cross is much larger than the radius of the nucleus so you can actually set up a equation for transmission of the neutron neutron is like a wave and going to hit the nuclear potential of the nucleus so at initially the you have a plane wave it is to i k x and in some, once it is captured the energy of neutron is much higher so the inside the nucleus is called it is to i capital k x so they there is a wave number of the neutron is changing from small k to capital k as it is transmitted through the potential well and the transmission coefficient is written as transmitted flux upon the incident flux so general scattering theory of neutron actually can be used to find out the transmission coefficient and this transmission coefficient can be in fact if you solve the scattering equation for the s wave neutrons because the, for low energy neutrons the angular momentum is zero it can be written to so four small k capital k upon small k plus capital k square and since capital k is much larger than small k so inside the uh, nucleus neutron energy is almost 20 30 mev and outside it will be thermal neutron so you can neglect the small k inside the nucleus so this small k can be neglected respect to capital k and so it becomes sigma n pi lambda cross square one k will cancel so small k about in capital k and this small k is nothing but one related to velocity so k is actually proportional to velocity lambda cross square proportional to one by v square lambda cross is h cross by mu v and so it becomes net result is one by so that explains the sigma neutron varying as 1 by v at low energy neutrons from the transmission position then for the the resonance, resonance region breit and wigner gave a formula for resonances for n gamma reaction which is in terms of pi lambda cross square the spin of the compound nucleus the neutron is half spin 2n plus 2s 2 into neutron spin plus 1 and the spin of the target nucleus 2ia plus 1 the width width for the neutron decay to gamma decay plus upon resonance energy epsilon 0 minus is epsilon minus epsilon 0 these are the energies and the gamma by 2 gamma is nothing but your gamma n plus gamma, gamma so these are the gamma actually they are the if you see the nucleus the certain levels have their widths that levels are called gamma for neutron decay and gamma for gamma decay there there are the widths of the new levels so the resonance formula essentially is quite accurately predicts the cross sections for the resonances for neutron induced reactions so we will not go into details but i thought it is good to tell them tell you that the resonances also can be explained by Breit-Wigner formula and the one by v also can be explained by the transmission coefficient formula now let us come to the charge particle induced reaction the scenario is different in the case of charged particles because there is a coulomb well here and so you try to consider a charged particle coming to a target nucleus so there will be a different types of potentials playing it play one is the nu nuclear potential 
which is attractive at short distances and there is a coulombic potential which is repulsive all along. So when the projectile is coming close to the target nucleus, it will experience the coulombic repulsion of the target nucleus which starts becoming positive at a longer distance and as it is coming closer, it will experience the attractive potential due to nucleus potential. So the sum total of the repulsive and the attractive potential will be this dashed line and this shows a barrier which is called as the fusion barrier. So for the light charged particle like proton and alpha, mostly we can say that Coulomb barrier, this can be called as a Coulomb barrier but when you take heavy ions into picture, then the nuclear potential becomes significant and so we call it fusion barrier. So right now we will use this as a Coulomb barrier. So this is the barrier the projectile has to cross. So now you see at from infinity the charge particle is coming and as it is coming down its momentum. So this is the center of mass energy, momentum is decreasing and at contact you know the momentum may become zero. So this is what I try to show here that at distance of closest approach the momentum is rho 2 mu ECM minus EC. The normally at infinity it is 2 mu ECM. But when it is coming close to the target nucleus, the Coulombic barrier, Coulombic barrier will start getting felt and so it becomes 2 mu ECM minus VC. You can take that 2 mu ECM square root the half outside, so you are left with 1 minus VC upon ECM to the power half. So this is the momentum at infinity and this is the momentum at contact. The angular momentum at infinity and at contact has to be conserved and you take the help of this formalism to calculate L max at contact R into mu 2 mu ECM 1 minus BC upon ECM. So this is R into P, R cross P is the angular momentum. So I have replaced this momentum, the linear momentum at contact with L max equal to R into that momentum and so sigma becomes pi lambda per square L max plus 1 square and since for charged particles you will find L max will be quite high so you can say pi lambda per square L max square 1 can be neglected with respect to L max. So now pi lambda per square sigma r equal to L max can be written as r by lambda cross or r p by h cross. This p is nothing but the momentum at infinity momentum of contact, so momentum and infinity into the 1 minus BC upon ECM and this is nothing but the 1 by lambda cross square momentum at infinity, so this will cancel with this. So you are left with pi r square 1 minus EC upon ECM. So the cross section for charged particle induced reaction, you can see here with ECM as the energy of the projectile is increasing, it will go up like this. So this is the BC. Beyond below VC the cross section is 0 and above VC the cross section will increase with increasing energy of the central mass. So this is what is the cross section for charge particle induced reactions are increasing beyond VC, cross section for neutron induced reaction decrease at 1 by V then have some resonances. So the charge particle induced reactions typically you know when the projectile is coming it can bombard with target or the compound nucleus. And let us try to see what is the excess energy of the compound nucleus. So, we calculate the Q value, mass of alpha, mass of niobium-93, mass of it is, it is niobium-97, this will be plus 2.437 MeV. And you can calculate the Coulomb barrier by 1.4382, Z1, Z2, 1 R0, A0 to 130, A1, 1 third plus A2, 1 third. You can substitute to get 14.05 MeV. So, let us try to calculate what is the minimum energy of the alpha that will be inducing the reaction or the threshold for the Coulomb barrier. So this is the energy available in the center of mass it will be into mass ratio 97 upon 93 compound nucleus upon target. So alpha particle should have 14.65 mg energy to induce this reaction. This is the threshold for Coulombic barrier. Let us take a case of 30 mv alpha particle which is higher than the Coulomb barrier. So in such a case, excess energy of the compound nucleus will be ECM plus Q, ECM plus 30 mv alpha ECM into 93 by 97 plus Q value will be 31.2 mv. 
excitation energy. So the compound nucleus nitro seven chrome uh, technetium will be formed with an excitation energy of thirty MeV, and then this co excited compound nucleus can emit neutrons, protons, gamma rays, depending upon the emission barrier and the angular momentum states available. So charged particle induced reactions, a hot excited compound nucleus can emit then gamma ray, neutron, proton. There is a competition between emission of different types of particles. So now you can have proton induced reactions like oxygen 18, PN, chlorine 18, cadmium 111, PN, indium 111. So these are the reactions used to produce useful isotopes like chlorine 18 for a propositron emitter indium 111 in nuclear medicine, zinc 68, P2N, P3N, P3N, P4. There are all some of the useful isotopes, how they are produced. Proton is bombarded with target and that compound nucleus is emitting neutrons. Deuteron induced reactions, you can have DP, D alpha, DN and alpha induced reactions, you can have alpha 2N, alpha 3N and alpha 4N types of reactions. So these are the kinds of reactions that can happen with the charged particles. The charged particle is uh, now forming a compound nucleus and the compound nucleus can emit neutrons, protons, alpha, depending upon the excitation energy and the available emission barrier for different particles. So I'll stop here and then discuss next the next lecture how to determine the cross-section experiment. Thank you.